totality, uh, these projects will virtually create a new red line for the South Shore. And uh, the third point I'd like to uh, mention is that uh, community partnership between the city, between the, the MBTA and others, uh, we will provide uh, more options for communities and create transit-oriented development uh, opportunities for the city of Quincy and the MBTA. Now, this second slide shows the projects that we will be discussing tonight, uh, along with their associated costs and timelines. Uh, you can see uh, one of the projects, the Wood Resiliency Project, is complete. Uh, we'll get into the details of that and uh, other projects around operations uh, next. And uh, so you can see clearly that the total investment uh, really suggests that this is a generation investment in the red line by the MBTA. So our agenda tonight is broken up into three portions, operations projects, which will be led by our MBTA Chief Operations Officer, Jeff McGonigal, transit facility projects around the garage improvements, the Quincy Center Garage Demolition, demolition led by uh, Parking Managers John McCormick and Joe Chima. And then to wrap things up, uh, we'll talk about community partnerships with our Chief Strategy, strategy Officer, Scott Bosworth. Um, with the Council's permission, uh, I'd like to ask if it would be okay to hold your question until the end of the presentation. You've got quite a few slides to get through. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll turn it over to Jeff Donovan. Good evening, Council Pleasant, members of the Council. Uh, and Rick said thank you for giving us the opportunity tonight to speak on some, some very important investments that we're going to be making uh, on the red line and some of the infrastructure out that's supporting the red line um, in this particular area. I'll be talking tonight about some of the investments that we're making in the actual operation of the system, the system that, that actually runs the, the, uh, the MBTA. Um, First off, we'll talk through winter resiliency, which is something that we've spoken a lot about in, in both the media and uh, in several of our, our MBTA board meetings. After the winter of 2015, I think many of you are very much aware of what happened with the, the MBTA and the MBTA's red line. Uh, we came to a triple and halt. Well, following that process, we knew that we needed to do some things differently. We knew that we needed to make our system and our infrastructure far more resilient. We knew we needed to invest in both uh, uh, real-born snow fighting equipment, invest in our vehicles to make them more uh, resilient to inclement weather, as well as making some upgrades in our infrastructure to also make that more resilient. We've invested about $110 million in two phases of programs uh, for winter resiliency. The programs span over the last two years. Uh, we have, as it relates from a, an infrastructure standpoint, replaced all of our third rail uh, in any exposed areas from JFK South, so that is both on the Ashmont and the Braintree branch. And for those that don't know, the third rail itself is that's what it provides the electricity to all of our trains. And the third rail that was replaced was a smaller, more uh, thermal conductive uh, third rail that we believe is, is uh, going to be far better for and far more resilient to, to inclement conditions. In addition to that, we replaced third rail heaters, which that is the device that actually heats the third rail to prevent snow and ice from building up and freezing on the third rail itself to ensure that we have good uh, electrical connectivity between the, the trains themselves. And there was a number of other upgrades that were went along with the program, as I mentioned, both vehicle upgrades as well as upgrades to, to um, the non-revenue fleet that is now available to us to clear snow um, from the tracks after we have a major storm. If we had any of those pieces of equipment of, of real born snow fighting, we would have not had the issue, frankly, that we had in 2015 if it wasn't really available to us. In addition, something that we did with the Winter Resiliency Program is we looked at our overall management and how we manage all of our storms and special events with the, the MBTA. Uh, we have a, a new practices and new policies that are in place now to ensure that uh, we are actively managing storms and events as they progress. The new red line trains are something that we are also equally excited about. Uh, the original contract was awarded to CRRC. They are the, one of the largest car manufacturers in the world. Um, we were their first North American contract. 
this is a project that is replacing our number one and number two fleets. And for those of you who are not aware, we have three fleets of vehicles on the red line. What we refer to as the number one cars, those went into revenue service in 1979. The number two car fleet, which went into service in 1986. <coughs> and lastly, the number three car fleet, which went into service around 1992. The original contract was to replace with one of the ones and number two cars. So one for one replacement. What we began doing and what we were working on over the last year is a study to, to evaluate whether the, it was warranted to do a midlife overhaul on the number the 86 and number three cars. Uh, those vehicles themselves now are due for a major overhaul and due for a major rework. Ultimately, the decision was made by our board to award uh, a, an additional contract to CRRC now for additional vehicles or replacing these 86 number three cars. Along with that, we are purchasing some additional cars to give us additional capacity on the red line. So this will give us now a total of 252 cars on the red line. Delivery of these vehicles is going to begin in 2019 and the end in 2024. Uh, these vehicles themselves are going to have a number of upgrades. An upgrade to their propulsion system, an upgrade to their braking system. They'll have a number of passenger amenities that will have them be improved on the vehicles themselves. Uh, wider doors, so our current doors on the, the red line cars now are about 48 inches wide. We're going to have a 64 inch wide uh, door opening. And when I move into the next slide, I'll talk about why that is important. One of the things that we've been looking a lot at is what we can do uh, to gain cap capacity and have capacity on the red line. Uh, we know that we have capacity issues now, particularly on this branch heading northbound in the morning. Uh, we needed to do something, and we needed to do something very quickly. The, 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 the combination of the programs that I'm going to be speaking about in this presentation, as well as uh, some future programs that we're going to be doing, we're confident that we can make a significant increase in capacity on the line. First off, as it relates to, to the 64-inch wide doors on these cars, as well as the passenger layouts and the layouts of the cars themselves, we believe that, that, that this will have a significant impact in the amount of time that people take to board and alight off of all of our trains. And uh, typically, in most transit systems, you want to see about a 45 second dwell time. That's the amount of time the train sits in the station before it proceeds out. At the MBTA, we see an average of a minute to two minutes of time for each station during the peak of when trains hold in these stations. If we can get that dwell time down to about 45 seconds, we feel very confidently that that in itself can give us about a 10 to 15 percent increase in capacity on the line. In addition to that, with the vehicles, and having one vehicle fleet now on the red line, we will have the ability to change the way our signal system is blocked along the lines. And what that essentially means is due to the upgrades to the vehicles and due to the way we set up our signal system, we will have the opportunity to run our trains faster for longer. So at the completion of this particular program, the delivery of the last vehicle is here, we expect that we're going to be able to increase our headways down to about three minutes between the trains. For those who don't know, we typically average on a good day about five minutes between trains in the core. Um, so that, in, in addition to that, we know that that will give us about a 50% increase in train capacity per hour, which is significant and is something that we're really excited about here at the team. Another project that's underway right now that is, that is certainly uh, not as glamorous as, as new vehicles is the, the traction power substation program. It's about a $20 million investment that is underway right now. The project itself is about 60% uh, complete. And we have five traction power substations that run along the branch Street branch up to JFK. Each of those traction power substations are essentially responsible for taking AC power, converting that to DC power, and that's what's we use to power all of our trains. Um, this upgrade now will obviously make our systems far more modernized and also far more reliable. Signal system upgrade. We currently operate on the red line a, a, uh, a fixed block system. It is an analog system that was developed and designed and placed into in service in the 1970s here at the Authority. Um, the system now is, is in need of replacement and is in need of upgrade. So we're going to be investing about $200 million into our signal system on the red line. Uh, this will give us the ability to, to, as I was speaking about earlier, change and make some modifications to the signal system itself. Uh, obviously, the <coughs> components will be upgraded with new modern components, and it will give us the capacity and the ability to get to that three-minute headway that I had discussed earlier. 
Uh, this project is going to be running in parallel with our new car deliveries, and we anticipate this project to be done in about June of 2023. It's also important to note that many of the delays that we see on the line right now are due to signal failures that our signal maintainers have to keep going every single day. So from a system reliability standpoint, this is another project that we know will have a significant impact to our customers and their, their, their writing experience at the MBTA. One of the, before I move forward, I think what I'd like to do is also just uh, introduce the team that's going to be getting up to first John McCormick and then Joe Cheever will be talking through some of the, the investments that we're going to be making into our parking facilities, our facilities along each of the lines. Um, after that, Mr. Bosworth will be getting up and be talking about some of the community relations, relations and some of the community partnerships that we're going to be doing with this particular project as we go forward. Because all of these projects are happening along the same timetable, along the same time frame. It's something we're really excited about, and, uh, and certainly, as Rick mentioned, we're happy to answer any questions you have on the Inclusion's presentation. Thank you. Good evening, John President and members of the Council. Appreciate it. My name is John McCormick. I'm project manager for the MBTA, Capital Delivery Fund. As Jeff mentioned, I'd like to uh, introduce you tonight to uh, parking garage projects, the uh, state of repair projects we have coming up. I'm going to start with the pantry if that's okay. Um, I she was, Quincy was once a part of the I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Our pantry station it is uh, a $31 million project. It's, uh, we're going to renovate it, make it accessible by adding two elevators. Um, bring it to a basic state of repair. Uh, that's through structural repairs, uh, replacement of existing systems, and uh, the addition of two uh, elevators, we've done that elevators. We're looking to start construction in the summer of 2017, and the construction duration for the garage re renovation is approximately 23 months. And as I mentioned before, we're looking at 31 million for a project <coughs> called construction costs. Um, just a scope of branch, here's a rendering that shows basically the redundant elevators and uh, stairway and basic stairway. Uh, the canopy you see uh, crossing the busway is a pedestrian bridge that is deficient and will be demolished and replaced by that canopy. Um, Rancher, we're going to increase the parking spaces, improve traffic circulation, we're going to replace all the signage in the garages, we're going to replace all the systems such as fire protection and fire alarm, we're going to add security cameras, um, some demolition of a stairway and making other stairways full compliant, structural repairs at the garage, and just to mention that we have this about completed an urgent structural repair contract at both Brain Tree and Quincy Adams. Uh, all the lighting in both garages will be uh, replaced, and replacement parking is going to be across the street from the Brain Tree parking garage in the landfill. The town of Brain Tree is working with us to turn that into a temporary lot. Approximately 130 spots now. All right, now coming into Quincy, Quincy Adams Garage. It's our second uh, largest garage on our system, behind the Yale on the other end of the Redmond. Same thing with uh, Quincy Adams. We want to rehab it to bring it into a state of good repair. That means a, a 40 year uh, life time, life horizon, I call it. We want to replace all the systems, and in about 20 years, all the systems will, will need selective replacement. And with that uh, selective replacement in about 20 years, we'll get another 20 on top of that. So that gives us the 40 year um, time. Same thing, Quincy Adams and Braintree are part of one contract, so I'll show the right of gifts, and that will start this summer. And uh, Quincy Adams will take water, it's 39 months. It's already accessible. We'll be adding uh, spaces and uh, we we'll adding a lot more accessible spaces also. The value of Quincy Adams 
construction is estimated at 42 million. Uh, this is just going over the scope of uh, <coughs> specifically of the atoms. This shows a shot inside of the atrium. The atrium will be uh, turned into a drop off pickup area. Right now, it's under the garage closest to the tracks, but we're bring that into the, the atrium area. There's one more garage I want to talk about, and it's right here, right next to us. Quincy Center Garage Demolition. We'll be taking that down uh, starting this summer. It's going to be part of the Walton Station Improvements Project. It's um, all from level five down to level two. Uh, will be removed. We'll leave level two with a fence around it and get it ready for the uh, development that is to come over the station. Uh, the notice to proceed is in summer 2017. That's the same as Walson. We're looking at a duration of 18 months. Um, a lot of that work uh, will have to be uh, looked at closely because it's a performance spec, so the design of the demolition will be done by the contractor. And so there will be a review period, intense review period of that. And the construction value of the Center demo is about $25 million. We intend to keep the station open during the demo. And that's, that's it. All right. Now, after we finish the demo, uh, we just got a <coughs> grant uh, for the city of Quincy, the amount of $4.2 million. That's to get the, what will be replacing the, the first part, will be a new bus facility. Uh, buses will, this is one of the busiest bus uh, stations on the South Shore. There's 15 bus routes here. We like to, uh, this new bus facility will bring them in on further parkway and remove them from the Hancock Street side and open up the Hancock Street side for development in the future. And that's going to be for the developer um, over the areas. I'd like to um, introduce my colleague, Joe Chiba, for our wall sensation. Thanks, John. Again, my name is uh, Joe Chiba, project manager from the MPTA. Um, not the president of the city council. Thanks for having us here tonight. Uh, so. We're going to continue on up the red line here to Walson Station Improvements Project. We've been working on this project, uh, it's been in design for, for a number of years. Uh, had a lot of good public meetings out there that to try to get as much information from the community as we could and incorporate that in the design, which I'm about to walk through. Um, so, Walson Station is the last one on the red line. It's not accessible. And we need to make that happen. Uh, that's, that's goal number one on this project. Um, it's, it's got you code, it, when we go in there, we, we, we make this accessible, which, which means elevators. We also need to make it code compliant. We need to bring it to a state of good repair. And when we do a project like this, and include all those components, we're also going to modernize the station. So we call this a full station upgrade. This is this is super nuts, A to Z. We're going to make this um, a, a modern, a modern accessible station. Um, there's also quite a bit of a site work that we're going to do, uh, site and utility work. Um, I'm sure you know there's several utilities that go under the station. We're going to improve a lot of those city utilities, uh, bring them up to a state of good repair, make sure that they're going to be just as enduring as the station itself. So like I said, in order to accomplish all these things, we're, we're doing a full station upgrade. From the existing station to the proposed, it's going to look uh, significantly different. Um, one of the key components is, is that existing lobby that you see under the tracks uh, that's existing today will remain. Uh, that's an important pass-through to connect the two, the two wards uh, in, in the city on the inside of the tracks. Um, yes. uh, so uh, so, <laughs> so and it was really important to us uh, you know, in, in, in meeting with the community and, and in the wards. Um, at one point, we looked at several different options as a way to, one of the key components of this is to add a means of egress off the platform on the north end. And uh, we could have done that in several different ways. Uh, and what we come up with is with a bridge over the tracks. Uh, so it's a total of three elevators. One in the existing lobby that brings up the tracks, or, um, or you can go up and over the bridge, which has two elevators associated with that. 
So what it does is it takes that existing lobby and expands it significantly uh, so that you have a nice, a nice uh, warm space. Uh, it's going to be something that you walk into and it's going to be um, uh, kind of like a government center feel, okay? That's what, I'm, what's, what we're trying to do is, is you walk in there and it's, and it's really eye popping. Um, it's something that you really want to feel good about going to every day. Uh, you walk down into the existing lobby onto the tracks, or uh, you can go, go up and over the bridge. And you have some options, and it's going to be um, it's going to be really a, a good endurance station for for a long time. And that was something that we worked with the community on, right? So at one point we looked at, at maybe we don't maybe we don't keep the pass through, uh, and we went out to the community with several community meetings. We were able to get that get that back in there, um, and now you're going to continue to be able to without having to go through the fair gates is what I mean. So you don't have to go through the fair gates in order to get from one side of the tracks to the other. Uh, so we've opened that up again, and they're able to, uh, to make that work. So um, I think it's a great station design that we have now. We worked work hard to get there, uh, and now we have to build it. Um, so we have worked very hard since we got to 100% design, looking at a lot of different ways to try to build the station. Um, taking into account, first and foremost, safety. Construction safety is so important to us, but also the safety of the passengers and, and the safety of um, safety of our of our, uh, of our contractor. So, um, also the customer experience. So, when you think about going to the station every day as it is today, and then going to the station every day uh, while it's under construction, are two very different things, and we have to take that into account. Uh, so, we looked at I want to say at least six different ways to uh, to to attack this hard station to build. Uh, one of the key elements is that it's 14 feet above the existing parking lot. It's a center uh, platform station, so it's really hard to get to the platform from, you know, if you're, if you're trying to construct it uh, or deconstruct the, the existing platform and the existing, uh, the existing concrete canopy. Uh, and so with those challenges uh, and the six different ways we looked at, at doing this, uh, what our approach is going to be is to is to do a station closure during construction, and what that means is that we we can actually reduce the, the total duration of the project. Uh, that's the amount of time that the station is actually under construction is less, um, which, like I said, from a customer uh, experience perspective, is hopefully a, 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 a something that they would value. Um, there's also 25% less cost, um, and it's and it's really important to know that. Um, it's a lot of less temporary construction. So what you have to do when you try to keep the station open is you extend the platform to the north, you extend the platform to the south, or you do some sort of plywood barriers to get folks uh, on and off the train. So the, all those things uh, go away with, with closing the station during construction. We had a lot of success in doing this uh, at Science Park a few years ago, a six-month station closure. Orient Heights up in uh, East Boston was an eight-month station closure, and then Government Center was a two-month station closure. Um, just like the government center, when we, when we open the station, it's fully code compliant, fully, uh, what we call substantially complete. Uh, you walk in there and the station is totally complete after that closure, which is what we're going to accomplish here. Uh, so what does that mean? That means when the station's closed, um, customers can't board or, or uh, get on and off the train there at Boston, but the trains continue to go through. And what we're going to set up is a, is a temporary bus service that will run from Wallston to North Quincy. Customers can still go to Wallston. There'll be two bus stops, one on the Woodbine side, uh, right on Woodbine Avenue, and another bus stop on Newport Avenue. Um, that way we're, we're accommodating both sides of the tracks there. And we'll run a bus service uh, from Wallston up to North Quincy. Um, again, those bus shelters, they'll have bus shelters. We're gonna have lighting. We're gonna have snow removal. We're gonna make sure those customers are accommodated and uh, brought up to, uh, to North Quincy. So again, it's a really exciting project. We're going to get this uh, this enduring station uh, up and built, uh, and I think we've come up come up with an approach here to attack this project as quickly as we can. Um, like I said, the, the station with 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 uh, Quincy Center demolition, Quincy Center garage demolition, is going to go out to bid, and, and we're going to have notice to proceed this summer, uh, and we'll get uh, we'll get this project going. Uh, very soon. So that said, I'm going to hand it over to Scott Bosworth, our Chief Strategy Officer.
views, members of the council, thank you very much. Uh, playing cleanup tonight, I'll try and go very quickly as I wrap up, so I'll leave your questions, I'm sure you have a bunch. Um, so I'm gonna focus uh, moving up the line up to North Quincy. By this time, I'm sure you're very well versed in the project in North Quincy, the, um, the development project uh, by uh, our partner, the Zudo Corporation, the Zudo Group in Atlantic Development. Uh, we're really excited about this project. We're excited about working with the city of Quincy as we have for the last few years to bring about. As you all know, it's about a $200 million project. It's going to bring on 610 um, housing units to the North Quincy parking lot. Uh, there's great public benefits to the project, including a very solid tax base of about $1.6 million a year, uh, which will certainly help uh, with the capital investment plan that the uh, mayor spoke of earlier. Um, after construction, we will have one for one parking. There'll be 852 spots available for um, our commuters, which is great. Um, it is uh, what's really important is our commuters and your citizens that use the station will have now direct access into the station from the garage. Uh, there'll be a electronic payment system. There'll be uh, parking availability uh, technology in the station, so we have much more uh, robust plus, you know, passenger um, experience. You probably know the schedule better than I do, but our understanding of uh, where the contractor is at this point is that um, construction of the garage will start in January of 2018. Uh, we're expecting it to be a less than a year project, and uh, the contractor will, uh, the developer and the contractors will work together to try and limit that as much as possible. And uh, during this time, though, there will be some parking interruptions. Um, the left hand side of the lot, or the, uh, the south side of the lot, um, will be construction zone. We are working with the contractor and will continue to work with the contractor to limit the amount of spaces that are out of commission during that time, but there will be um, spots taken offline. So as a result, um, those of the people in the crowd can see it, you have in front of you the next slide, uh, show some of the parking areas that we are looking into. Uh, we we have entered a process uh, um, we entered a process with uh, your, one of your vibrant uh, employers here in town, Grant Telecommunications, to try a, um, a parking solution that would benefit both of us after a few months. So unfortunately for us, uh, the uh, success of Grant Telecommunications it just didn't work out. They could not afford to have their parking lot down for the construction of a, uh, of a, uh, a jointly paid for parking facility uh, for the period of time it would be. And that, that's a success story. It's unfortunate for both of us because it was a unique public-private partnership. So we've entered a process that to, uh, to find spots to mitigate. The first priority is on-site. So we believe that with uh, the existing parking lot, we would work with some engineers and redesign what will remain there. Work, as I mentioned, work with the contractor and its developer uh, to limit the amount of spots that are available. Uh, there is a part of working with the city. Uh, we look to uh, look at Community Boulevard. We uh, indicate actually phones up for quite a while, seeing if it's possible to park along the side of that road, Community uh, Boulevard, as we go forward. Uh, but that may, may, may not be enough. So we're reaching out into the community as we speak to uh, look for partnerships. Uh, you mentioned in the slide here, we're looking at some of the um, apartment complexes in the area to see if they can do a daytime sharing of. Um, arrangement with us. Uh, hopefully, you know, a lot of these facilities uh, where people are gone during the day, we can be able to uh, work with a partnership with um, Doing the same with the employers down in Heritage Drive, you see, uh, you know, obviously it's uh, State Street and Granite, uh, they're really thriving down there, so it may be difficult. We're hoping that we might be able to find a, um, a solution down there. We've even contemplated, I think it was the suggestion of uh, Senator Keene, perhaps your staff, about maybe even letting the high school uh, charge for some parking during the summer months when it's a kid's lot and let them keep the revenue and do something fun with both of the kids. So uh, we're looking at all kinds of things. And then we do know, uh, we do know at the end of the day, uh, we will have the DCR lot down at Strong Point. That will be there, and that will be our plan D. Uh, but it will be there, and uh, you know, ultimately that's what we need to do to, to replicate the spots and make sure we have them for our passengers and your uh, constituents, we will do that. But in order to do that, uh, we're going to need to um, we uh, work with the city in our uh, the delegation. Uh, we work on a series of mitigation uh, amenities that we're building into our program of projects here that we feel will be helpful. Uh, one of them is the 
um, is a continuation of NJ Boulevard. Um, most of you all are probably well familiar with it. You can see up here, um, right by Boston Scientific, it actually comes from the end. Uh, working with the city and the prodding of the city, the mayor and his staff, uh, we have agreed to fund a $2.1 million project to connect that to the DCR lot, which is back here, um, which uh, ultimately, as you know, has seasonal water transportation. So we will uh, continue our efforts with the city to uh, get the contract in place to do that and, and uh, the permits and everything all of it required um, for us to go forward. Um, and as soon as we get that up and running, we will. Um, additionally, we're quite aware of the traffic along Walls and the Boulevard and uh, the mayor and uh, his staff um, requested of us along with the, uh, the, the legislative delegation asked us to consider a uh, tool that worked very well with the bridges under the Ponsa River Bridges under its uh, construction, which is having a morning rush hour um, police officer there to direct traffic. The, um, the detail down there has worked very well in the past, uh, and we've agreed to, to uh, have a detail in spot down there during the construction period of Wallace, uh, the Wallace Garage, which is the longest of all of the projects in the uh, program of projects that we're talking about. <coughs> Ferry service, uh, obviously uh, we have a seasonal service that hopefully we'll be getting up and running fairly soon. We do have a dock issue down there now. Uh, we are, our partners at DCR, I understand, are working on that with you and your staff and the mayor's staff. Uh, but we are committed to working with the city to uh, help make sure that runs again this season uh, to the point where we have, uh, the Secretary of has offered to subsidize part of that along with Winthrop. Um, I will note as long as nobody from Winthrop is watching, uh, that, that commitment is uh, as long as the schedule works for the people. Uh, it's important that the schedule works for you, your constituents. Uh, so we are continuing to work with Morning Geary, and she continues to work with Winthrop and the operators to make sure that it works. Uh, additionally, on water transportation, we have committed to doing a study, a long term study, of the uh, permanent water transportation in Quincy. This is a, this, there was some confusion on this. This is a study that is being done for Quincy, not all of the other uh, uh, harbor towns uh, along the way. So uh, we're excited about it, and uh, we're excited about uh, continuing work with um, Frank Tremont Posey, who I understand uh, had surgery and he visited, but uh, he's been very, very good to work with. Uh, Maureen, um, Jim Fatsies, Chris Walker have all been excellent to work with through this process as we uh, continue to. To, uh, plan these investments and ultimately bring them on board. I did, before I uh, wrap up here, I do want to mention we have a few people from that have been working very hard. Uh, Beth Larkin is our deputy general manager of Capital Delivery here. Her and her staff work very, very hard on all this. Neil you know, Chan is our chief of real estate for the MBTA. Paula Fallon is, is in the chief operating officer's, uh, um, chief operating officer's office, and that is very, very helpful in keeping us organized and moving forward. Um, I can't uh, wrapping up here, we have a very robust planning uh, plan to reach out to the community, to get one-on-one -on -one with the community. Uh, this is the beginning of a process. It will be ongoing uh, before construction, during construction. It will be on the ground, and it will be successful. Uh, we uh, will continue to brief you all, our legislative delegation. We met with a few times and keeping these bars together. And, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you said you're a supporter, but you're going to be watching us very, very carefully through this process. And as I wrapped up, um, um, the mayor has been absolutely terrific. Um, he has been a terrific partner in this, an absolutely terrific partner, but he has been a tenacious, um, tenacious uh, fighter for the people of Princeton, um, and making sure that these projects, although they're great, there is an impact on the work part of the staff to make sure that we, uh, you know, we make it as as possible. So, as I wrap up, and, um, <coughs> we give you a sense of the excitement that we at Mass.MBTA have for what it is program or project for the Red Line. We, together with you and the citizens of the Mass Commonwealth, are going to be delivering a brand new Red Line, virtually a brand new Red Line. And it will be great. And uh, we thank you very much. We thank you for doing your partnership with Quincy. And we are open for questions. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. Uh, yes. One Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I want to thank you guys for your time and your team to be up here tonight. Um, 
you come on a great night with the capital improvement plan by Mayor Coke and all the investment that's going to be put into the city with this council's approval. Uh, approval. Um, you come at a great time where the city is doing so much um, at all different tea stations or around that, the downtown district, which, are, which is right outside here, um, right outside the uh, Quincy Center tea station here as well. Um, just a few questions. I don't know which one of you guys will be the main point person, but um, I just want to roll off the fact that um, I, I attended a Waltz and Tea um, MBTA meeting last January 14th. Um, it was a little over a year ago with Councilor Kane in Ward 3. Um, we were at the design phase. I thought that the Waltz and Tea station was going to be underway already. I know we're, we're pushed out to July. Um, I was going to ask what was the reason behind why it took so long. We'll start with that question and then we'll do the other one. Absolutely, I'm probably best to answer that. I was sure. I think at that meeting. I, I remember you, yes, that's right. So, so right, and, and we got to the 100% design as, as anticipated in the end of August. Uh, um, yeah, right in August. And uh, we were essentially had the design completed in September. And then the challenge of how to build it um, really needed to take a deep breath, quite frankly. And so, like I laid out here in this presentation tonight, we looked at several different options. And, and I'm not just saying that. We really, we really put together um, what we call, what we call a 